I'm very flattered to be invited to, uh, to talk to such an esteemed group. Um, and it was such a, a great way to, to uh, segue into what I'm going to talk about because my area is really translational science. I've spent the last 40 years uh, communicating between scientists and the general public, basically, and that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about here to finish off the day this afternoon. Um, it has struck me that uh, uh, we have been through a couple of eras of, of, of health and looking at this historically, this is no surprise to any of you, but the infectious diseases were the, the predominant killer back in the Middle Ages and beyond, right up until the 1950s, really, when we started to get hold of it. Um, just a little bit of history, which, again, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar of, with uh, that the, historically we thought that, in, that the, the infectious diseases in particular were related to what was called miasma or something in the air. Um, it was only in the 17th century that Van Leeuwenhoek, uh, with the discovery of the microscope, started to see minute organisms under the microscope. Uh, and then it wasn't until the 19th century with Pasteur and Robert Snow's uh, famous removal of the Broad Street pump handle in 1854, and then Cox postulates that de de developed in 1884 when we started to get a hold on infectious diseases. And the way, the way, the big uh, uh, thing that happened here uh, was that we started to conceive, we, had a, we started to get a monocausal focus on disease. In other words, we were looking at germs rather than a whole variety of different types of bacteria, viruses, and protozoa, and so on. That's changed, of course, dramatically and cha has changed in, in all, in most of our lifetimes. There'll be a few, few younger uh, of the presentation, present, uh, presentators here um, won't have seen it, but certainly in my lifetime working in health over the last 40 years, we've seen this dramatical shift from the infectious diseases uh, as being the predominant disease burden to the chronic diseases. And uh, that really started about 1980. Boyd Swinburne, myself, uh, published a book a couple of years ago called Planet Obesity, which you've no doubt all got in your bookshelves at home. You must have because there's none left in the bookshops anymore. Um, and they, I think they only printed about three copies anyway. Uh, <laughs> the press never picked it up. But basically what we were saying was that the start of the obesity epidemic was about 1980. And it happens to coincide with what we consider to be a sweet spot in Australian development, if you like, economic development. And since then, we have passed that sweet spot and we're starting to get negative returns on investment. In terms of health, in terms of public health and specific aspects of that, but we have to look to the big picture to see why this is being driven at the moment. And the big picture includes the economic environment as well as the social and political environment. And the economic environment being, in particular, uh, the, the system of economic growth that we, uh, that we live under. So just to sum up, you've got this drop in, in acute diseases, infectious diseases, historically from around about the, the uh, start of the Industrial Revolution. There's a little tick at the end of this now, of course, with the new infectious diseases cropping up. Uh, and where that goes, we're just not quite sure. Of course, the death rate from all diseases has gone down dramatically and we've uh, increased our longevity by about, uh, by 50%, um, of, but sorry, by 100% uh, over the last 50 to 100 years. Um, but to take, uh, take over from this, I remember when I started in health, we thought that by the turn of the, the, the millennium that we would have everything under control. I was working in health, pro health promotion in the health department back in those days and we didn't know what sort of work we'd be doing around the turn of the millennium. Of course, the decline in infectious diseases saw the rise in chronic diseases, and we have this period here called the epidemiological transition, which some of you will be familiar with, uh, which happens in, an economic, in economic development in any country. And we've just seen this happen in the last 10 years in China. We're about to see it in India and the other BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, and China. Uh, and that's where the chronic diseases start to take over in terms of the disease burden from the infectious diseases. So, and of course, this is uh, particularly associated with years, uh, disability affected life years. So, although the death rate is going down and, mortal uh, and longevity is going up, are we living better? We are living longer, but are we living better is the question. And some, some of the recent data that's coming out is suggesting that maybe we're not. We're living longer with uh, greater disabilities. So we, we've, for years, since the 1950s, when Dole and, uh, and, and Hill uh, came up with the first hypothesis about smoking causing cancer, we have tried to do what we've 
do to chronic disease what we've done to infectious disease. That is, provide a, some sort of monocausal focus so that we aren't operating in silos when we're dealing with infectious disease, when, with chronic diseases, such as heart disease, diabetes, polycystic ovaries and so on, cancers and so on. And of course, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with, with Bradford Hill's criteria, which were developed in the, in the 60s. Um, not very clear, not very, not um, a, a, a good way of sort of uh, bringing together the chronic diseases like we had the infectious diseases brought together. And in fact, if you look at it, the beauty about the, the germ theory was that we were able then to come up with the solutions to it in terms of hygiene and public health, the antibiotics, immunisation and so on, by this monocausal focus, which epidemiologists sort of continue to look back on as a glory period when we're about able to do, deal with this group of diseases. With chronic diseases, though, we don't have an alternative a, a way of looking at this, or at least I'm, we haven't had up until uh, the moment, and I'm going to suggest one for doing this. Uh, going back to the old epidemiological triad, and I'm sure even the clinicians in the audience are familiar with, with this, uh, this approach, this broad public health approach, of host vector environment served us well with infectious diseases. In the 1970s, there was an engineer from the public health department in New York who actually applied it to injury, the, the uh, epidemiological triad, uh, and he said, this was um, uh, William Haddon, who said that you can look at injury, let's say take motor vehicle injury, for example, in a similar fashion to the way that you look at, use the epidemiological triad for infectious diseases. In other words, the driver of a car is the host, the environment is the road that you're driving on and the, the weather and so on, and the vector is the, the, the car that you're driving, uh, the agent of that vector being the speed of which you're, you're driving at that level. So um, we, when you put these things together with infectious diseases, the vector, for example, can become uh, the mosquito, and then we get the infectious agents, the agents then uh, associated with the vector, uh, and then we get common markers such as inflammation that occur with in infectious agents like this. And hence we were able to focus in on this monocausal, uh, um, the, the single cause of infectious diseases. But of course with chronic diseases that doesn't happen because we don't know the agent and the agent can be variable in various, uh, within various diseases. We, and we, don't, we haven't up until the, uh, recently anyway had a common marker of infectious diseases. But that's all starting to change. Initially we thought that it was associated with obesity. And obesity back in the, uh, when I started working in obesity with, which was in the uh, late 80s, 1980s, uh, we, we started to see obesity as a specific disease in its own right. And it took a lot of time uh, up until just recently, it was only this year that the American Medical Association has defined obesity as a specific disease. It happens that many of us that started off trying to get obesity defined as a specific disease are now saying we don't think it should be a specific disease. I certainly don't. I think it's more of a risk factor for disease than, than a disease itself. We know, for example, and uh, I apologise for the, the slight translation between um, Apple and, and uh, IBM, although I thought we'd fix that, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Not to worry. You, you know, you're all familiar now with the fact that you can get uh, a significant proportion of obese people who have no metabolic risk factors and a significant pro proportion of lean who have all the risk factors that you would expect of the obese. It's about 25% of the lean population. This is 10% of the total population. 25% of the lean population comes up consistently in the literature that has have the metabolic risk factors that you would expect of the obese. It's about one third of the obese who are metabolically healthy. The only real problem that they seem to have is is uh, mechanical, hip, hip problems, and maybe some psychological problems as well. Now, of course, this happens with all disease. Not all smokers get cancer, uh, and you, you can expect this. But we know from, and I'm sure uh, I don't need to go into this with you, we know from uh, the, the, the data that's starting to come out, including things like the obesity paradox, uh, that there is confusion with the link, the direct link between obesity and disease. And looking at the, the, the basic physiology of a fat cell, which again I'm sure you're all familiar with, we know that fat cells expand uh, according to energy balance uh, and you either get hypertroph hypertrophy or hyperplasia. In the first instance, we, you get hyperplasia when the fat cell becomes full. Uh, 
and then in the second instance you get uh, hypertrophy. Once hypertrophy, hypertrophy, hypertrophy develops to a certain level, you get an influx of macrophages within the fat cell, within the adipocyte itself, which seems to indicate an immune, an immune system reaction to the expansion of the fat cell to its limit. And we now know quite clearly, although uh, it's not as well defined in the, the literature, that the biggest problem is when these fat cells spill over into uh, the ectopic supplies, into the blood, the liver, the muscle, and the pancreas, is when we get the uh, ongoing problems that lead to dysmetabolism and, uh, and long-term disease. The, the, the question is, and the, one of the big uh, problems, is just how do we know where you get this spillover? Because there are obviously lean people who spill over at a very low uh, level of body fat, and there are obese people who don't spill over at even the high level. And this classic uh, study, which again I'm, all, I'm sure you're all familiar with, with the two sibling mice where one has had its leptin gene uh, downregulated uh, and it becomes obese, it gets the metabolic syndrome, but it's sister mouse that's had the leptin gene downregulated, the adiponeptin gene upregulated, uh, doesn't get the metabolic syndrome. It's, it's actually bigger, it's fatter, but it doesn't um, suffer the same, doesn't get the metabolic syndrome, doesn't suffer the same problems uh, as the, the other mouse. Now, there are obviously upgrades on this. This was published back in 2007, so there's been uh, significant changes from there. My interest, though, is a as an epidemiologist, uh, biologist, is, is looking at the, the big picture here, what's, what's the factors associated with this uh, influx of, or this change in obesity over time and the relationship of obesity to disease. And, of course, uh, there's the old system of, of inflammation associated with infectious diseases, the, the dola kala ruba tumor that we're all familiar with, uh, where you get sudden um, violent sort of inflammation the, the um, purpose of which is to confine an invading microorganism, basically, uh, to certain parts of the body, uh, and then it's returned back to basal homeostasis. It was 1994, though, when Herder, um, um, Gherkin Herder Mislikel from uh, Harvard University uh, actually found a different type of inflammation associated with obesity that he then called in his 2006 Nature article um, metaflammation or metabolically induced inflammation, which is more of a smouldering type inflammation. It's chronic, it's, it's systemic and, and so on. Um, and one of the things that's come up consistently is that this type of inflammation is associated with chronic disease with or without obesity, and that's the point that I want to make here. I've only put up one, one paper for each of these, but there's a, a whole range of papers that are associated with each of the four diseases or four categories of chronic diseases that I've got here. And metaflammation seems to be an underlying factor associated with, uh, with each of these almost invariably. So metaflammation starts to become an underlying marker of what's going on in chronic disease. As I said before, the typical uh, idea is that you get spillover fat from en positive energy balance, which then leads, leads to um, uh, metabolic disruption here, which goes on then to lead to uh, dysmetabolism and insulin resistance and chronic disease and so on, with that metabolic muddle in the middle, whether it's metaflammation or uh, oxidative stress or whatever it is. We've also found, though, that you don't really need to get fat to get inflamed uh, or to develop uh, metaflammation, that this can come from the environment itself, the broader environment. Exposure to pollution in the environment, for example, is, is one way of inciting metaflammation without having to go through the obesity channel. So the question then becomes, is, is obesity the cause of the disease or a cause of diseases or is it a marker? Is it really a canary in a mine shaft that's telling us that something bigger is going on in society? There are bigger problems that are going on in, in society. Uh, and when you look at a number of studies that I'll put up here quickly, but this is lifestyle risk factors and mortality, you look at this, this, uh, the lifestyle risk factors here, uh, just quickly up the top there, you probably can't even see it up the back, but obesity is not a factor in that. It's the number of lifestyle risk factors that are associated with mortality, not the obesity per se. So you can have these problems with the things that cause obesity, irrespective of whether you get the obesity or not. Again, this is the number of studies showing the risk in, in uh, the reduction in risk in, with exercise without changes in weight, and there's been a whole number of these. Bob um, uh, Ross, uh, 
from Queens in Canada has been on about this for several years, that you really don't need to get changes in body weight to get improvements in risk factors. Uh, and again, if we take diet, uh, this is just one of many studies that has now come out looking at uh, decreased inflammation, just looking at one simple measure of high-sensitive CRP without weight loss after five weeks on a Mediterranean diet. Now, presumably on that diet after five weeks, you're going to get weight loss as well, but you get immediate inflammatory uh, reactions without the weight loss. And the question then is, can you clamp the weight loss, can you clamp all these different lifestyle factors and then see if there's an effect without, uh, without weight loss. So John Dixon and myself from uh, Baker IDI have spent the last five years, I guess um, the type of work I do in my latter years these days is more desktop epidemiology. I let other people do the work and then I interpret their inf information. And what we've done here, and we've published it several times now, is taken all those inducers, that's the, the term that's used, they're not antigens as they are in infectious diseases, but inducers of metaflammation and put them together on one side here. This is the pro-inflammatory inducers. Then we've taken the anti-inflammatory inducers, all published in the literature, and there's a lot more now of these than uh, I've just put up here. And we've tried to, to factor analyse, if you like, or do a discriminant analysis on the left-hand side versus the right-hand side of this graph here. And the only thing that we can come up with is that all of these things here, the anti-inflammatory inducers, are, are stimuli or inducers that have been around since before the Industrial Revolution. And I'll show you that in a graph form in a minute. Whereas all these ones here have only de been developed since the post-industrial revolution. So in immunological terms, you would say an, uh, that in, historical, in, a his in, in, in an historical sense, all those anti-inflammatory inducers, and this again has been thrown out a little bit on the presentation here, but basically all of these have been uh, used by humanity over several thousands of years. And so we've had, we've had time to adjust and to adapt to all these different stimuli. Whereas if you look at all the pro-inflammatory stimuli here on the right-hand side, uh, sorry, on the bottom of the graph, they've all really only developed in the last 50 or 100 years, which coincidentally is around about the same time since the rise in chronic diseases. So the question, and, and what categorizes these? How do you categorize these? Well, uh, again, we've looked at these quite closely and tried to come up with a, an all-encompassing term. And the term that we have used is anthropogens because anthropogens are what man-made environments, their byproducts and lifestyles encouraged by these, some of which may be detrimental to human health. Um, I, I get sort of laughed at from time to time because I've come up with two words now, two unique words, the first one being the obesogenic environment that Boyd Swinburne and myself used in 1996 in the British Journal of Medicine. Um, which then went into the Oxford English Dic Dictionary. This one here, anthropogens, I notice now is in Wikipedia. It hasn't gone into the Oxford English Dic Dictionary. But I'm sort of hoping that uh, if I achieve nothing else in my life, I will at least have two words to, uh, that my kids can um, come back and look at. That's if this one takes off, of course, and this will be up to people like you as to whether it does take off. So what we've got now is the two categories of diseases down here. You've got the infectious diseases, with the germ theory, which then leads to the, um, the propositions of, of what we can do here. And instead of now, sorry, uh, I'll come back to that. Um, instead, what we're saying now is that we couldn't, with infectious diseases, we haven't been able to come up with a, a monocausal focus because we've been looking at the agent. We've been trying to define an agent all the time. And even without the agent, we've been trying to find, as Bradford Hill did, we've been trying to define criteria that identified the uh, inducers, if you like, of chronic diseases. Whereas what we maybe should be looking at is going back to looking at the vectors rather than the agents. And the vectors are these anthropogens that I just talked about. And the, the ma common markers then that come out of these anthropogens is the metaflammation that seems to underlie just about all, if not all, chronic diseases. So going back to here, the infectious diseases, now we've got the uh, chronic diseases, We've got this anthropogens hypothesis, and that's all it is at this stage, of course. But that leads into a whole different focus. Uh, the area that I've sort of um, been, more, been involved in recently is this notion of lifestyle medicine, where uh, lifestyle is not just the simple term of what I do with my life, but it encompasses the bigger picture of the environment in which I live that encourages me uh, to do the sorts of things that I do within my lifestyle. And just expanding that a little more, 
uh, what are those factors then in the lifestyle and in the, in the environment? And what I've tried to do here, and again, this has just been accepted uh, in um, a couple of publications, is to come up with a, a number of uh, categories, a number of lifestyle associated categories under an acronym, uh, being a, a, a sort of poor man's epidemiologist, I love to use acronyms like all epidemiologists uh, do to disguise their other deficiencies. And the acronym that we've got here is nasty odours. And if you look at all the categories here, it used to be nasty doctors. And I presented this to a group of doctors out in the country recently. There was an American doctor there who abused the hell out of me for saying, for coming up with this notion that doctors could be nasty and that you could use an acronym that had nasty doctors in it. So I expanded it to nasty odours now. <laughs> Um, and if you look at these, what typically, when you talk about lifestyle and behaviourally related uh, uh, determinants of chronic disease, people normally stop around about nutrition, activity or inactivity and stress. But there's a lot of other things here. This one here, it's not actually technopathology, it's, it's, sorry, it is technopathology, uh, uh, which is the, the types of pathologies associated with the use of technology. Now, this is a new term, again, that, uh, that uh, we've come up with, but it, it, it applies to uh, things like screen dermatosis or to uh, RSI from using machines, but it also more recently applies to things like traffic accidents while, by texting while, texting while you're driving. We had, where I live over in Manly, we had a death last week from a girl um, using a, a mobile phone um, while she was talking to her boyfriend uh, driving. So uh, this covers a, an, an area of... Um, lifestyle and environmentally induced problems that's not covered by these other things. Inadequate sleep, of course, is a major one. The environment, including air pollution, and I'm talking about not only the environment here, but the environment, that is, gut microbes, if you like, and we could go into that in a lot of detail. So each of these, of course, is a major, major discipline in itself, and I, I'm only um, able to briefly skim across the top of these with my expertise. Occupation, drugs and alcohol, you've got over and under exposure here. And then of course the other thing that's quite often neglected but Michael Marmot has brought to our attention significantly recently and Richard Wilkinson, Kate Piggott, the relationships and social um, disadvantages that can exist in communities are very highly associated with chronic disease rates. And of course all of these have links with metaflammation or there's this underlying basis of, of metaflammation. So looking at this from an epidemi epidemiological perspective, a good epidemiologist doesn't just look at the disease and then the risk factors and markers of the, of the, of the disease, such as things like blood pressure and obesity. Now I put obesity in the risk factor category here or risk factors and markers category here. But then you've got to go back and look at the determinants or the drivers of each of these things. And you can't just look at the proximal drivers because if you look at just the proximal drivers, smoking is a cause of cancer. But what causes smoking? It's like saying salmonella is a cause of disease in Sydney on a Friday night, but we don't know where or at what restaurant or whatever, if, if, you, take, if you take the infectious disease analogy. So you have to go back from the proximal uh, causes to the, the medial causes or the midstream causes, right back to the distal causes, the upstream causes. And this includes things like the physical, the economic uh, and the political environment. And we could go on and talk more in detail about that. So summing this up, and putting it in a, uh, a nice schematic like this, if you like. You've got the, the distal causes out here, that the environmental causes that we know are the, the big drivers of chronic disease. And uh, as I said before, the political decisions that are made, economic decisions, the economic system that we live under, the social environment that, that we live in, drives these other factors here. Sorry? drives these other factors, the medial factors, the proximal factors. That leads to the risk factors and the markers there, which leads on to metaflammation, which then leads on to chronic diseases and so on. So looking at obesity now, and this is not fully developed, but uh, please bear with me, because uh, I'd like you to think of this in a slightly different way. Sure, obesity does lead to disease and is somehow associated with disease, but it's not a necessary component of disease. You can get disease and you can get these markers of metaflammation without going through the obesity link. Uh, and it's associated with those other environmental factors that I talked about. So again, uh, putting this into context now, we're, this shifts us from a linear approach to looking at chronic disease, and particularly obesity, where we have thought for years that weight equals energy in minus energy out. It's a, it's a physics formula, if you like. 
uh, that you, you would concoct in a, a, in a test tube, but it's not. There are significant other factors associated with it that make chronic diseases, including obesity, a systems theory model, and everything feeds back on everything else. So if we take the nasty odours here and you look at the links between all of these things and then the connection with the, the um, uh, environment, it becomes uh, a, quite a different proposition to look at uh, not, not just obesity but chronic diseases. I'll leave you with this um, here. We do have an Australian Lifestyle Medicine Association at the moment. We are having our fifth annual conference over at Manly next weekend for anybody who's interested. Uh, and lifestyle medicine is, is a, more of a, an applied translational science area. We have about 25% clinicians and, uh, sorry, GPs as clinicians and about 75% allied health professionals as clinicians. It's a new way of sort of looking at the whole system. There is now a global lifestyle medicine association as well and we've been given the rights to run the first global lifestyle medicine association world conference uh, in Sydney next year, uh, later next year. And just to finish off, this is the nasty medicine. This is the, our latest logo or latest model in the Australian Lifestyle Medicine Association. It's putting all the nasty, nasty odours together in a, in a circle like that to talk about the uh, association between lifestyle and environment. So please, uh, I've been criticised all my life for concentrating too much on lifestyle because this leads to victim blaming. We tend to then say, it's your problem, it's not our problem. Governments love this. They can, they can talk about lifestyle uh, and it being the individual's problem, whereas lifestyles are created by the environments in which they are uh, imposed and we have to go back to those bigger environments if we're going to, if we're going to look at the problems of chronic disease. Thank you.